Good morning, everyone. Everyone today. This is Tom Wilder. Uh, welcome to Walking Working Surfaces. Again, I'm Tom Wilder. I'll be your trainer today. And uh, most of you already know me, but for those of you who don't, I've worked with for the Department of Labor almost seven years now. Prior to that, I worked 28 years in various safety training and quality management positions in the textile, machine assembly, and pharmaceutical industries. Most of those years were in the pharmaceutical industry from which I am now retired. So a little bit about me. I know uh, many of you already. Uh, we'll go through our logistics for those of you who are new to these webinars. Look around your work area and try to limit any distractions. If you have an office, uh, you want to close your door, turn phones off, or if you're in a cube, use headphones and put up a do not disturb note. The tool we're using today is Webinato. You'll see the PowerPoint slides in the screen. And during the session, you can maximize those to make them bigger. you got a couple of maximize buttons. And uh, when you want to chat, though, you'll need to return to your main screen so you can see your chat. Uh, the emoji on the bottom left will not be using it due to the size of the class. And on the chat on the bottom, you'll see the chat box, which a lot of you have already been using. If you can't see it, scroll to the bottom of your screen to see the chat box. And I'll take your questions or comments there. For credit today, you must attend at least 80% of the course. After the session, I'll check the times to make sure I know who actually should get credit. And we cannot give credit to anyone who's not registered and logged in. So if you have multiple people sitting around you, only the person that's registered and logged in will receive credit. Um, certificates are processed once each month. And you'll get electronically, uh, should be within three weeks. Otherwise, give D. Bryant a call at 919-807-2877. At Our webinar today is scheduled for an hour and a half, but regardless of its length, you'll get an hour and a half credit, which you can use for certifications such as your MESH. So we've got all our uh, logistics out of the way. And uh, again, we're talking about walking, working surfaces. Uh, around the end of uh, 2016, uh, OSHA revised the entire walking, working surface standard. Uh, they have been working on it for years. And so as we went into last year, this whole standard was being phased in. And we'll talk about the phase in of that standard. And again, we're talking about it today because slips, trips, and falls are a major cause of injuries and fatalities in the workplace. So uh, it's one of the main ways that people are getting hurt at work. So it, it totally makes sense to cover this. And I uh, just want to note that this is the general industry standard. Um, it, with this new standard, a lot of the new uh, requirements have been uh, essentially lined up with the construction standard. But again, it's the general industry standard. So if you're doing work that falls into the general industry category, um, this is what you'll be working with as far as the standards concerned. But again, uh, in construction, um, the general industry standard essentially has adopted the construction standard for scaffolds. So there are some changes there, and we'll be sure to talk about those today. Now, uh, as I usually do, I want to go ahead and do my instant polls that I do about every webinar. I want to go ahead and look at your experience level with this topic. What is your experience level with this new topic, walking, working surfaces? So let's see, um, so we'll see where everybody falls here today. So what is your experience level with walking, working surfaces? This relatively new OSHA standard, or actually newly revised standard. It, it was around before, but again, it's had some major revisions. So for those of you who have responded, that we have one person that's advanced. Right now we have 10 are intermediate and eight beginners. So we'll be teaching to the lowest level. So some of this, a lot of you will already know. But anyway, if you learn one new thing today, then um, and that will be great. OK, uh, Avanda says you can't see today beginner have, having to use mobile. So sometimes when you have mobile devices, even though there's application, 
the vendor or Webinato has been having a little trouble with these mobile devices. So sometimes you'll log on and not see the PowerPoint slides, so it end up being an audio webinar. So if you're not able to go to a computer, um, it's not the best thing to not be able to see the slides. So um, Avanda will do the best you can. But again, uh, we recommend uh, people to use a regular uh, device. So uh, we see the breakdown as far as your experience level. Let's go ahead and stop that poll and um, go ahead and do one more poll. And this is professional safety experience. How many years of professional safety experience do you have? So I want to see how you fall in the safety field in our audience today. And let's go ahead and start this poll. And as, as before, we'll see a lot of diversity there as far as our professional safety experience. And all of us in the safety field you know, had to start sometime. So our zero, zero to one year folks, we got at least seven right now. Hopefully you'll learn a lot today. And others, hopefully you'll learn a thing or two that you didn't know before. So let's go ahead and stop that poll and close it and go ahead and get into the PowerPoint slides. Now, what I have done, okay, Erica, okay. Uh, you've been teaching classes since 2015, okay. Now, um, so again, we'll start uh, with the topic here. Today, uh, we're gonna go through, as you can see on the slide, definitions, requirements, ladders, We'll talk a little bit about step bolts and manhole steps, stairways, dock boards, scaffolds, duty to have fall protection and falling object protection, fall protection systems, and training requirements. Now, on your slide on your screen, you see a little tiny picture. And you may not be able to tell unless you maximize your screen. And you can do that a couple little maximize buttons. Now, if some of you want to maximize that screen, see if you see any issues as far as our topic today in that picture. Now, if you don't maximize it, you're probably not going to be able to see. Um, can anybody see in that little tiny picture? What do we have issues with? And I wish that picture was bigger on this slide because I know a lot of you probably can't see it very well. You did, there are ladder issues. Now, now, Brian, if you could see, you'll see um, that, that there's a ladder extended to the roof. And it's, uh, it may not be high enough or the ladder angle may not be correct. Uh, we have a leaning step ladder used uh, improperly, so step ladder is not correct. Stephanie, like you say, you need a three foot overhang there at the roof. There are several issues in that picture, and um, so uh, we see this stuff all the time. I mean, we're driving down the road. I mean, you don't even have to look very hard. And also, I. I don't know about a branch across the ladder. I'm not sure about that. But I do. I will tell you there's a person on top of that roof that's not tied off. So there's somebody up there not using fall protection. So there, there are lots of issues there. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Once you go into this new standard, you'll, you'll see several definitions. Some common ones are the three that you see here. Anchorage. So uh, if you want somebody in personal fall rest system, they're going to have to be tied off to an anchor. Now this anchor, and I'll go ahead and, and hi I'll highlight this anchor right here. This is a, a temporary roof anchor. Now you'll see that mostly in construction. But if they're putting a roof on the house, they'll properly attach this anchor to the uh, peak of the roof, uh, with usually with screws properly attached, and they'll have one person clipping off to this anchor with a uh, lanyard or a lifeline. To, so if they fall, 
uh, that that lanyard that lanyard or uh, retractable system is connected to a harness and it keeps them from falling off the roof. So we'll talk about anchorage. Uh, here's a standard guardrail. Now in your workplace, you may have a lot of guardrails up in different places. We'll talk about those today. That's standard guardrail. Um, here's here's a handrail. Now handrail is going to be on the closed side of a stair. In other words, the stairs that are up against the wall is going to have a handrail versus a stair rail. And you probably not going to be able to tell from this picture at all, but if you could blow it up enough, uh, this is where a construction of a building or our area of the building has actually been finished and they have some anchor straps that were built into the building for a person to tie off to for fall protection. And uh, a lot of times when these buildings are built, they'll essentially cut those off. So that's what that top right picture is. Okay. I uh, will also talk about personal fall arrest systems. Now in construction, if you're in the construction business, you're very familiar with these. Um, you'll have like a harness, like say there on the right, you see a person with a harness on, and uh, there's a D-ring on the back of the harness, and you've got a, uh, a lanyard that's connected to that, a lanyard coming down, and then that's gonna go up and connect to an anchor point so if that person falls, it's going to limit or, or actually arrest that fall. They're going to literally fall a little bit, and it's going to stop them. It's going to arrest a fall. So that's a fall arrest system, and typically they'll be connected to a retractable, kind of like a seat belt. Uh, when the person travels out, it, it, it gives you more distance until you fall and then it snatches or catches and, and stops their fall right then. And uh, th there's a lanyard to the left of it. And uh, this is a connect, this, this, this connects to the anchor point and it has to be double action uh, so it won't twist out of the anchor. So you'll see the personal fall arrest systems. Now, uh, we're not looking at travel restraint systems, but a travel restraint system would let an employee not go over the edge. They won't even be able to fall at all. They won't go to the edge or the point where they would fall. It stops them and it restrains them. And then the other one is a positioning system. Uh, if you're working on a vertical wall, this would allow you to double attach to a vertical wall to free up your hands. So that's, that would be a positioning system. Okay. Now, um, the next slide, of course, talks about surface conditions. Every, uh, we're talking about good housekeeping. So OSHA can cite for housekeeping. So they're going to look at where people go, passages, storerooms, service rooms, surfaces, to make sure they're clean, orderly, and sanitary, and that you don't have sharp protruding objects, loose boards, corrosion, leaks, spill, snow, and ice. So as you can see on that little photo there, uh, that is not good housekeeping, and there are several issues there. We have a container there, a chemical con container, uh, and like I said, you have just a bunch of junk lying around, which you have all kinds of hazards essentially everywhere. So that, of course, would be an issue. Now, uh, is this a clean, orderly, and sanitary area, all three? What, is, what do you see wrong? You correct it. Erica and Jen, Jennifer, what do you see wrong in that photo? Philip, what is wrong? Block panels, right, no access. 
Okay, so you got to have, like Spencer said, you have to have three feet access out from those panels. And that is something that is very, um, uh, there, there's a heater there. Uh, there appears to be blankets or something there. And we don't know if that's just being stored there or not. Um, no clear path to the door. That's an exit discharge. That exit door goes to the outside. And we have to have a clear exit route. Fluorescent tubes not in a box. And I, and I don't even have mine maximized. Let's see. I want to look a little bit closer. Uh, probably is the case. You'll also see, um, you'll also see uh, unlabeled chemical containers. You've got this. You got the panel. You got something up here on top. You don't have a clear exit route. Uh, there's there's a, a big mess here. So um, this picture actually was taken by a compliance officer who's doing an OSHA inspection. So uh, this can lead to, of course, several citations. Now the blocked electrical panels. That's something that compliance officers see a lot. And a lot of times uh, you'll have a company and they'll have a closet, say for example, or a little room that's off the main area and you open up the door and there's a panel in there and they use that room for storage. And next thing you know, you can't even, you're lucky if you can even see the panel, but in an emergency, you need to be able to access that panel at all times. Okay. Let's go to the next slide. Now the new standard says that surfaces are inspected regularly as necessary and maintained in a safe condition. Now when do companies um when do companies inspect? When does your company inspect? When does your employer inspect? <laughs> James, that's funny. Is this your garage? <laughs> um, so when do companies typically inspect regularly? What would their regular inspection be? And we're talking about general industry, not necessarily construction, a general industry standard. When are they when are they inspecting? This is not a hard question. <laughs> okay. In some cases, daily. Uh, so when you're working for a company, you should you should be aware at all times if you have conditions change, like housekeeping conditions change. So you're going you're going to have workers looking out for uh, for hazards, and you're going to do formal inspections on a frequency, and like safety committees might be inspecting monthly or you, you may have the supervisor have a daily or weekly inspections, but you should, like Spencer says, you should have some kind of uh, routine inspections of your workplace. Um, and when, when people do those inspections, they need to be trained on safety because if they don't know what a safety hazard looks like, then they're not going to see anything. And a lot of times it could be something like a electrical and they may not have enough understanding to even detect the, the hazard. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide and talk a little bit about ladders. Now ladders in this newly revised standard, all, all the ladders are covered and then they have to meet the requirements in the section. And it says except when ladders are used in emergency operations, firefighting, rescue, law enforcement, or training for those. So if you have an accident scene, if you had a major accident at your work site and the fire department responds and they start setting ladders, I mean, if an ocean inspector showed up, uh, they would not be citing them for ladder angles and that sort of thing because this is an emergency and um, they would be exempt. And the ladders are not covered if they're built into the machines or equipment. If they're designed into the equipment, it's not covered by the general section on ladders. Now, 
What about that ladder to the right there? Okay, Spencer, homemade ladders aren't good. So is that ladder okay there in that picture? No. Okay, so uh, that ladder is not good, and maybe you can't see it well enough on your picture, but this ladder is not good. Um, now, uh, let me ask you this. Does OSHA allow you to build a compliant wood ladder? Could you build a compliant wood ladder? Not the one we're looking at there. That's just slapped together. Okay. And even if you can't tell from your screen, uh, that ladder is not compliant. But you can, like Erica Erica says you can build an OSHA compliant ladder. It can be a, a re regular single ladder or a double cleated ladder. They can be built to spec. But I will tell you, when you figure the cost of labor and materials for that ladder to meet spec, most of the time you're better, better off buying a properly engineered ladder. So most of the wood ladders I've seen have been on construction sites and they've been double cleated ladders. These are gigantic double ladders where you can move a lot of employees up and down quickly between levels before the stairs elevate, before everything's completed. They're, all the employees are ha having to get up and down from di to different levels from these big double cleated ladders. And of course that's construction. And ladders must meet the general requirements. Now who, um, who sets the requirements for ladders initially? Who sets the design specification for ladders? Okay, then the manufacturers are going to comply, but even the manufacturer, who's going to set the standards for them? ANSI, that's correct. They're American National Standards Institute. So ANSI actually sets the standards for ladders and the companies that build ladders build them to ANSI specifications. OSHA doesn't set the ladder standards. OSHA just implements those in the OSHA standards. Now, um, for those of you who can even tell what's going on in that picture, again, I apologize for its size. Um, what's wrong with that picture? A ladder on a van, and that's a step ladder, like Will says. Wrong ladder for the task. Do not put on top of vehicles. Yeah, so the ladder's on top of a van, and it's a leaning step ladder. So um, this was taken by a compliance officer. A compliance officer takes a picture like this. They open up an inspection, and of course, there will be a citation there. You cannot use a standard step ladder as a leaning ladder. Those ladders will slide out. They're not designed for that. They have to be opened up and, and locked in the open position. So, um, but again, you'll see people out there, um, okay, uh, out there doing this sort of thing. Now, Jen has a question. Would the property owner and the contractor be responsible? Okay, let's just say, um, let's say this is a homeowner. If you're a homeowner and you, buy, you hire a contractor to come do some work for you, I would say in most cases, the homeowner is gonna be fine, the contractor, and the contractor is always gonna be responsible. But let's say that this is a construction site and you have a general contractor you have the general contractor and the subcontractors both responsible here. So it depends on the situation. Now, uh, what about at a university? Um, when, you get, when you get into employers, like at a university, like a homeowner is typically not an employer. You're, when you're at your house, you're not, you don't have employees there. The university does. 
Uh, university would be kind of like in construction. That would be a multi-employer work site. If you have contractors working there, you can be held responsible for some things that the contractors are doing. So um, just because you have somebody in there doing work doesn't mean that the university or the employer could not be held at least partially responsible. Because you have rules and conditions that the contractor has to work in and uh, rules that they have to follow. And you can't just let them do anything they want to. Um, if you see this, if this was a university and you saw that, uh, the, the work would probably be stopped and the contract contractor would probably be thrown off the site because uh, we can't allow people to work unsafely. Now, ladders must be inspected before initial use in each work shift and more frequently as necessary to make sure there are no defects. Now, this is a damaged ladder. So I'm looking at a damaged ladder. It does look warped, but it's actually damaged. Something struck that rung there and bent it. So if you're a safety professional, which most of you are, maybe everybody, and you're seeing that in your workplace, now this is a fixed ladder, uh, what, should we, what, what should we also be seeing here? Okay, right, Lynn. Remove from service, tag out of service. Tag out. Now, it wouldn't necessarily be a lockout, but it would be a tag out. Now, it wouldn't necessarily be a lockout, but it would be a tag out, and you would be tagging it out with an out of service tag. So uh, the standard, as you can see in this slide, any ladder that's defective is immediately tagged, dangerous, do not use, or with similar language and removed from service until repaired or replaced. Okay. Now, uh, that's a red, we call this red tagging equipment. Um, now, let's say, now you can repair ladders. I mean, if they're repaired back to factory specs, using parts that are correct for that ladder and brand, if, uh, some of them can be repaired. But let's just say you're going to throw out that ladder. What's the proper way to throw it away? What's the proper way to throw away a ladder if you're an employer? Cut it up. That's right, Arnell. Cut it up. Break it down. Destroy it. Because if you throw that, if you throw a defective ladder in the dumpster, Somebody might drive by or maybe be an employee. They go, hey, I can use that at home. I think I'll use that at home. And it probably has your company name on the side. Somebody takes it at home. The ladder fails at home. They fall to their death. And next thing you know, you've got a bunch of lawyers involved because it's like uh, chemicals. It's like a cradle-to-grave thing. Um, be careful about what you throw away that might be reused because people can get hurt. And that's also true with chemical drums and those sorts of things as well. So uh, the proper thing is to destroy the ladder because um, people try all kinds of crazy things at home. But if you're a safety person, you shouldn't use broken ladders no matter where they are. Now you have to face the ladder when you climb up and down. And you have to use at least one hand to grasp the ladder when you're climbing up and down. Now, a lot of people say three points of contact. Now, if you look in the standard, it doesn't say three points of contact. Um, it uh, says use at least one hand uh, to climb up and down, So, which is kind of the same thing. And you should not be carrying any object or loads while you're climbing. Because if you're carrying something, uh, it's hard, it's well, actually impossible to have at least one hand grabbing the ladder as you're going up. So if you've got tools, you're going to use a tool belt. Or when you get to the next level, you might have a winch, a rope, or some way to hoist up 
uh, whatever else you need. Okay, now, of all the ladders, you always have to be facing the ladder when you're working or climbing the ladder. What's the one kind of ladder that you do not have to face the ladder when you're climbing up and down? A little interesting question. Because most ladders, you have to face them when you're going up and down. What is the one type of ladder where it's okay to climb down the ladder backwards? What kind of ladder would that be? What if I call them? It is kind of a trick question. Yeah. Daniel, you've got it. Because uh, Daniel said rolling ladder with handrail system. So now, Brian, you may have been thinking about rolling stairs. So if you're thinking that those are rolling stairs, if they're, uh, if they're classified as rolling ladder, they've got like I said, handrails, it's like going downstairs, but it's, a, it's called a mobile uh, ladder stairs. So that's the only ladder where you could uh, go down backwards. So um, it is kind of a trick question. But uh, any other kind of ladder, people shall not be going up and down backwards or working backwards just like this guy is in the picture. Now, a staircase, a staircase is clearly stairs, so that, that would not be a ladder. Now, ladders have to meet uh, design standards that are set by ANSI and are built in by the manufacturer. And all these ladders have a maximum load level. Now, um, this, this ladder label, um, this on this little step, step ladder, uh, says 225 pounds. What type of ladder is 225 pounds? I, I'm thinking about five ladder types. What would 225 be? Maximum of 225 pounds. No, it wouldn't be a step stool. And now class three is 200 pounds. That's a good answer. Close. So if it's not a class three ladder, then it's probably a or, or, or a type or class what? 225. Two. Erica, you're right. You win the virtual prize. So it is a type two ladder. Now in uh, in the area of employment, a lot of companies won't buy type two and type three ladders because they need a higher duty, duty rating. So they'll buy a type one, which is 250, a type 1A, which is 300, or a type 1AA, which is a 375 pound ladder. That's, now, the weight, like I said, when you're climbing the ladder, you have to think about any your, your tool belt, uh, anything being carried. The, you shouldn't be carrying anything that ties up your hand. So anything your body is transporting that's essentially connected to you, that has to be part of the total weight. So uh, you and anything else connected to you, that's all part of the weight, the weight that uh, we're not going to exceed, like in this case it would be 225. Now, let me go ahead and stop. Do, do anybody have any questions or comments at this point, or are you good to go? We'll pause here for a second and see how everybody's doing. Okay, good to go. And that's good. That gives you a chance to type. It helps you stay awake this morning. All right, everybody's good, so we'll go ahead and continue. Now, portable ladders that need to be on stable and level surfaces. Uh, single rail ladders not to be used. You don't you don't move a ladder while an employee's on it, and you don't you don't get on a ladder and jump it from point A to point B. You know you'll see crazy videos on the internet where people try they're on ladders and they jump they jump the whole ladder from from A to B. This is not the circus, so uh, we. 
We don't move ladders in any way with people on them. And we don't put them in places where they're going to be struck by people or traffic. Now, um, how do we how do we keep ladders that are near people or traffic from not being struck? How do we keep the ladders from being struck while a person's on them? If they're near a doorway or near a road, how do you keep people from being struck? Barriers, spotters, that's right, rope it off. So go ahead and set up a work zone, set up a spotter. Uh, you may have a spotter by the door saying, hey, we can't let you through here right now because I got somebody on the other side on a ladder. Keep a spotter to keep people away or rope it off or put cones and rope or tape out, set up a work zone and prevent people from getting near that ladder. You don't want people nearby. You don't want fork trucks, trucks, vehicles, or any of that stuff nearby the ladder. Now this, um, this ladder here has been staked off to keep it from sliding out. But um, could that person have done a little bit better job you might need to maximize it to see it a little better. Yeah, that person could have done a better job. So if a person's sliding down that ladder, if they're falling and sliding, what can they come in contact with? What could they come in contact with? Yeah, the protrusions, those stakes, when they could cut, they're definitely going to come in contact with the ground. Eventually, because you you know you just gotta eventually go to the lowest point. But uh, those those stakes right there could cause, in some cases, a greater injury than the fall. So a nightmare would be some. Th these are bad, but even worse than those is somebody t took rebar, metal rebar, and staked the ladder with it, and didn't have rebar caps on it, and people fell into the rebar. It would be very very dangerous. Okay, well, this is common sense. A cap in the top step of a step ladder, the top cap cannot be used. You cannot work off the top cap of a ladder. And I can't tell you how many times that compliance officers have pictures of people working off the top cap. Now, if you've, if you've been working for a number of years, I'd be surprised if many of you have never in your life seen somebody do this. And if you're a safety professional and you're walking around your place of employment and you see somebody working off a top cap through a ceiling or something and you don't say anything or do anything, shame on you because uh, this is not allowed. And, you know, you know, your job's not always to be popular with everybody. But if somebody's doing something dangerous like working off top cap, well, you've got to stop that right away. And the ladders need to be secured. You need both side rails supported. So this ladder here in the bottom, and I guess unless you maximize it again, this is going on a corner there. So both of the side rails are not supported. It's just the rung there that's supporting that ladder. Now, are there devices out there that you can add to a ladder to allow them to lean them against a pole or a corner of a building? And I'll get to Arnell's comment here in a second. Are there, are there devices that you can legally, properly attach to, say, extension ladder to lean them against a pole? or a corner of a building? And of course, <laughs> the answer is either yes or no. <laughs> actually, actually you can, even a pole. So your ladder manufacturer, and it could be Louisville, Warner, 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 any of these manufacturers, they sell legal attachments to make those ladders stable against a corner or a pole. 
So if if you have odd situations where you're going to put that ladder in, where you can make it more stable by adding a safe attachment, that would be okay. Now, Arnell says, the best I've found was an extension ladder ratchet strapped to a bucket of an excavator. They were lifting the guy with a boom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, like I said, if you've been out there, you're going to see some crazy stuff for sure. Now, when we train people on ladders, whether you're in construction or general industry, and they're going to a higher level, um, you have to have a proper ladder angle. Now, um, how do you set a ladder to have that proper ladder angle? How do you do that? Let's say it's an extension ladder, and you're setting it against the building. That's correct, four to one rule. So um, for every, you know, say every one foot you go up, you're going to be out four feet. Now, what's a quick and easy way to set a ladder to that angle? Now, that's going to be a 75 degree angle. Okay. What is a quick and easy way to set that ladder? And I know somebody on the webinar must know this. There we go, Will, Daniel, Lynn. I knew, I knew some of you knew. So what you're going to do is you're going to put your feet at the base of the ladder against the side rails, with your toes against the side rail, and you're going to reach out for a rung straight out with your arms. If your hands are grabbing the rung, you've got a, about a 75 degree angle. So that's proper. That's a quick and easy way to do it. And all of you are correct. Good job. That's a fast and easy way to do it. Now, um, now some of you may have smartphones, uh, probably almost all of you, if you have a smartphone, uh, NIOSH, uh, National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, they have an app that we, we show you in training sessions. It's called Ladder Safety. And what that app will do, it actually will measure the ladder angle. And it'll give you a green signal on a little gauge showing that you got your ladder set correctly. Now that's Kind of a really nerdy thing to do, but it's fine. If you've got a smartphone, you got the app out, you can lean that ladder up and put the phone against it. And if you're in the green, you're good to go. Now, that NIOSH app is very helpful. It's got a lot of ladder and safety inspection tips. It's got a lot of other information on there from NIOSH, but it does have a uh, app on there. So you can check level and ladder angle. Erica, you've got it, and, and I've got it too. Um, but like using the hands, that works as well. Now that ladder has to extend at least three feet above the edge. Now how, what's a quick and easy way to know whether it's three feet or not? If you're looking from the ground. I'm not asking, yeah, three rungs. I don't want you to go up there with a tape measure and measure it. Count the rungs. So if you got three rungs, you got three feet. Now, when you train your employees on ladder safety, a lot of times you'll train them saying, hey, if you're going to an upper level, it's got to extend at least three feet. But tell them why. Tell them why it needs to extend three feet. You think, they think, they think, um, well, you're just trying to give them a hard time. Why do you want that ladder to extend above the edge for safety reasons? What does that help them do? What does that help them do? Okay. Okay, give us a handhold. And you know, when I'm talking about counting rungs, it's approximately three feet. So uh, if you're counting three rungs, you know, it's, it's typically going to be three feet. But um, 
that, that's going to give you a handhold. So just think about yourself at home. If you have an extension ladder and you're, cli you're uh, climbing onto a roof, you're coming off that ladder. It, that's a funny feeling when you go to that roof, unless you have a flat roof. Uh, when you start getting off, because you have nothing to hold on to, and you're getting ready to put your foot on something that's not level. Dangerous. Okay. Now you're not going to tie or fasten your ladders together. Now in this photo, which may be too small for you to tell, these ladders are duct taped together. So don't put ladders together to make to build a longer ladder. Now, uh, so you're not going to duct tape them together. And this is not the circus. Like I said, this is not the circus here. Um, down here in the bottom right. Uh, I would be, it would be sad for me to talk to anybody that set this up. Okay, you're getting ready to get on a ladder. You've got a little platform down there at the bottom that's got rolling wheel, the wheels on it. And then I'm going to put two boards and then a ladder on top of that. No, you cannot do that. But, you know, if, if you see something at work that starts looking like a circus act, then uh, it's probably not going to meet the OSHA requirements for sure. It's going to be dangerous. Okay, uh, fixed ladders. Now, fixed ladders, that's one of the biggest change, changes in the new, newer revised walking, working services standard. So they must meet their maximum load by design. And they must extend at least 42 inches above the access level or landing platform. And that's to give you something to grab. Now, um, a while ago, we were talking about when do you not have to face the ladder when you're using a mobile ladder stand or mobile platform. Now, that's, it, when they have wheels on them, but when you get, when you get on them, they're designed to not roll anymore through their design. Uh, your weight's going to cause this uh, outside part to drop down with little rubber feet on them uh, to not allow that ladder stand to roll. So um, you may have these and um, you'll see them in stores a lot like home improvement stores. You'll see them use those to uh, retrieve materials. Okay, now we're not going to spend hardly any time on this. Now, step bolts, uh, if you see a telephone pole outside and you see metal rods, looks like metal rods coming out each side and they're alternating, those are step bolts. Those are made so somebody can climb the pole. So manhole steps, uh, you may have a manhole at your workplace if you take the lid off. Uh, you'll see these manhole steps going down. Uh, that's covered by the standard, and they must meet spec, and they must be inspected. Because eventually, over time, those things can rust and break. Okay, now let's get back into the more common world and talk about stairways. Now, most of the places that we work, we have stairways. Now, they could be your... Uh, emergency stairs or any other kind of stairs. So in the standard, it call, anytime they talk about stairways, we were talking about lots of different types of stairs that you can read here on the slide. Now we're not talking about stairs for floating roof tanks, scaffold stairs, built-in stairs on machines, and on motorized equipment. That's out of scope for this little stairway section. Now, your stairs, if they have at least four risers or four steps, if you have at least four steps, you're going to have to have something to hold on to. And that's going to be a handrail or a stair rail, depending on whether there's a hazard on the side or not. Now, this is, this is one change from the old under OSHA standard. Um, 
the new standard or newer revision says that when you're climbing stairs, if you had if you had a, a piece of wood that was 80 inches long, if you set that wood on each step, it should not be able to contact anything overhead. You got to have six foot eight inches clearance all the way up these stairs. And um, I remember years ago I worked in a building and by, by design they didn't build the stairway right and the ceiling height was way too low for the stairs. Now the old standard was actually stricter. The old OSHA standard uh, before 2017, uh, you had to have at least seven foot clearance above that step. So the new standard actually is a little bit less strict. And, and why did they make that change? I have no idea. But that is one change from the old standard. So after the webinar, you can have fun with, with OSHA standards if you want to. And you can go back in one of the old ones and look at this, this requirement. Used to be seven feet. So look at this, this requirement. Used to be seven feet. Rise and run. Your stairs are going to be typically between 30 degrees and 50 degree angle. And you'll know when you're when you're climbing steep stairs. And if they're very steep, you might want to measure that angle. If you had that NIOSH app, that would be really easy to use because you have it right there on your smartphone and it's free. But um, you could have some stairs that weren't designed correctly. All right. Now this little table in the standard talks about the range of angles for different um, types of devices that we climb to get to a higher level. One's for ramps, standard stairs, ship stairs, alternating tread stairs, and ladders. So you see the, the ladder, the angles uh, depend on the type of ladder or type of stairs they are. And these are the acceptable ranges. Now this is really an interesting picture here. Uh, this is a picture of a, at a nuclear power plant. This is, this is a stairway that's going up, up to a cooling tower. So you got a gigantic cooling tower on a nuclear power site. And you got these stairs that are built to go over to the tower. And then you have probably some kind of fixed ladder or something else to climb all the way up. So that's what that is. Uh, the standard switches over to dock boards. If you have uh, powered industrial trucks and you're running forklifts in and out of um, trailers to unload them, You'll be using a dock board so you can safely access that uh, trailer. And these dock boards have to be put in place and they need to be kept from sliding. And they have to have runoff protection by design. It's a little lip that comes around the side, runoff protection. And they must be secured when, they, when they're being used. Uh, I was very lucky when I worked in the industry for 28 years. Most of the places I worked, we didn't use manual dock boards. We had um, these dock levelers that were built into the floor. The real auto automatic or leveler. We didn't have to carry these uh, dock boards around. These things are heavy. And a lot of times um, they're designed so you can take a fork truck and move them around. So uh, if these aren't properly designed, the person on the fork truck can get hurt. Or you can get hurt trying to move them around. So the standard does get into dock boards. And here's a bigger picture. And uh, this is a major change in the OSHA standard for general industry. The general industry standard used to include scaffolds. Now, if you're in general industry and you're not doing construction activity and you're using a scaffold, uh, you're going to be required to follow the construction standard for scaffolds. That's 1926, the OSHA uh, construction standard. So uh, the good news about that is there's one standard for scaffolds. You don't have a general industry one and a construction one. Sometimes they could be different and have different requirements. 
Now there's one requirement for scaffolds. Now in general industry, stand, in general industry, a lot of times uh, companies don't use scaffolds because they take so long to build unless they're a mobile scaffold. So a lot of times you in industry you won't see companies building scaffolds because, like I said, uh, they have to be built correctly, inspected, and all that sort of thing. A lot of times they won't mess with them. Now, what kind of mobile scaffold will you see in industry a lot, in general industry standards? It's a type of mobile scaffold. And you can, you can have a scaffold that has wheels on it that you push around. But what other kind of mobile scaffold will you see in a lot of industry uh, settings? And people don't call them mobile scaffolds, they call them something else. That's right, Erica and Erica. Scissor lift, scissors lifts. Those are essentially powered mobile scaffolds. They're fully railed all the way around. They go up and down. And uh, they're essentially a mobile scaffold. So um, those, are, those are, of course, scissors lifts. Now, this, uh, this scaffold picture was taken in downtown Raleigh. It was taken about a block from our building here. We don't have to go very far to find pictures sometimes. Now, let's say you got construction activity, not at this moment in time, but you got construction activity occurring. Let's say you got workers on top, you got workers working. What, what, is, what is missing here? We got people going in and out of this building underneath that scaffold. What is missing here? Okay, not roped off, but they're allowing people to go. Okay, Erica, you're right. A tarp or a catch net to catch falling items. You have somebody working under a construction work zone and you don't have any falling object protection and that there may be a tow board at the top of that scaffold, but in many cases that's not going to be enough because if they're stacking a lot of materials high on that scaffold, a tow board isn't going to be provides enough safety there. So it's odd to have people walking through a scaffold and there's no catch net, safety net, or work zone there. People can just walk in and out of this building, and you have people working up here. Uh, dropping things, things being kicked off here while just an employee's walking out of this building. Anchorage. Now, the standard did make a big change for rope descent systems. Now, rope descent system is a system that, let's just say, a window washer uses. It'd be a, like a little boat swing chair or a little seat that's suspended from the building that the person can manually uh, go up and down with rope, you know, pull themselves up and down with little ropes and pulleys. But this rope descent system, if you have window washers and they're suspended from the top of the building, first of all, they can't be more than 300 feet high. Now that's pretty scary thinking about 300 feet. But if you're using a rope descent system, you can't have anything longer than 300 feet. And the building owner has to certify that all those anchors on top have to be identified, tested, certified, and maintained. And it has to be annually inspected by a qualified person. So uh, if you're a building owner and you have window washers and they're suspended by a rope descent system, like boat swing chairs, then uh, you have to have um, certified documentation showing that those anchors have been inspected. That's, that's a new, new requirement. Now, um, here are some anchorages here, some ropes coming to, or actually cables coming to an anchor. Now, th these anchorages here are really for a suspension scaffold. But when you get on the roof, uh, there will be anchors, if, if you're using window washers, anchors that they use. Those anchors have to be um, 
you know, set, you know, the lifeline anchors have to be 5,000 pounds or twice the uh, a double safety factor for your worker. Now, let's get back into regular fall protection. Anytime you have a worker in a general industry standard and they're, they're four feet or higher, they need to have fall protection to keep from falling to a lower level. Now, the new standard says, hey, uh, we don't care how you protect them from falls, but you better prevent people from falling. So you can use positioning systems, railing, um, you know, that any, any way you can do it to keep people from falling over that edge. So in this picture, you want that room there, you need that ceiling to be load rated for that load. They're throwing a bunch of stuff up there. And you got people up there, you can't sub subject them to a fall hazard. So um, that's talking about fall protection. But you'll see in a lot of companies, they'll build a lot of room, a little room inside of a room. And next thing you know, they're throwing a bunch of material, or not throwing, but taking a bunch of materials up to the top. And you're worried about those, those materials falling through the little ceiling there, or people falling off the edge, you know, falling down. So uh, that's, not, that's not proper there at all. And you need to protect people below from things falling off the top and hitting them, get kicked or pushed off the, the top level. Now, fall protection, there are some other standards that cover powered platforms, aerial lifts, telecommunication, and electric power generation. So um, when you get into aerial lifts, again, that's a different standard. Now, again, if you have people four feet or more above a lower level, you must provide fall protection. So we're looking at a cooling tower at a nuclear power plant. Now, I know you can't tell from this picture that there's railing at the top. Why is there railing at the top? Because people sometimes need to go up there to work. They're not building the cooling tower, but they're going up there and, and changing a light bulb and one of the lights in the top, or they're doing something up there. So if you don't have railing up there, they're going to have to be protected from falling while they're up there. But in this case, they've got railing up there. Now, uh, again, in industry, if you have somebody at four feet or higher, you have to protect them from falling using guardrails. Or I don't, I've never seen a safety net put out for like this application or a personal fall arrest system, travel with such strength or something to keep them from falling over the edge. Now, there are two problems, at least two problems with this photo here. What do you see wrong in this picture? The chair. <laughs> well, that's probably not a good place for that chair. What else do you see? Improper guardrail. Now, you can use chain or rope if it meets the specification strength-wise. But you can't have too much slack and see there's no mid there's no mid chain or mid rail here so it's either going to be double rail or chain but this little sing, single looping chain would not be good uh, the wagon below well the wagon below uh, if somebody's not falling off of there that might not be a hazard but again uh, when you're going upstairs, if you have four or more risers, you need guardrail. So it looks like they may need something here as well. Right. Good comment. Now, is this correct? Yes or no? Is this correct? No. Now, one thing I've always said in safety training is trailers never die. You see trailers going down the highway, tractor trailers, and they're pulling these trailers. They never die. And one of their retirement homes, these trailers, is uh, might be your workplace. You say, oh my gosh, we've run out of space in the building. We need to store a bunch of junk. Hey, there's a place we can rent a trailer from. 
So have them pull that trailer in. And you pull the trailer in, you can say, hey, we've got to get in and out of there. So they build stairs and a platform. So what's wrong? What's wrong with this picture? No railing. That's right. So um, if you have more than four, you have four risers or more, one, two, three, four, five, six. You need railing, railing, railing. You know, uh, this isn't right. And um, you also need to inspect the floor of that trailer to make sure the floor is uh, safe enough to hold the materials and to walk in and out. And uh, you've probably ever heard of Fork trucks falling through the floors of trailers that were all, they'll, they'll push one of these up to a dock, put a forklift in there, and actually uh, the, the floor will give way of the trailer. So what should it look like? Well, again, uh, you need stair rails and stair, standard railing. Stair rails here, double stair rails, and double railing up here as well. Uh, you can't subject your worker to a hazard. Not allowed. Now, uh, now if you got holes uh, by design or holes anywhere, you got to keep people or materials from falling through there. Now, a hole would be at least two inches in its smallest dimension or it could be big enough to be called an opening. But uh, a lot of people fall to their death through skylights. And if you ever get bored, uh, you might want to Google search uh, skylight fatalities, and there'll be people that die falling through skylights. Now what happens is you might hire somebody to come work on your roof. You've got a skylight up there, and they may be doing HVAC work and it's break time, and there's nowhere to sit down. They go sit on the skylight. The skylight breaks, and then they fall 30 or 40 feet to their death. So these skylights, what are they required to have? Skylights. What are they required to have skylights? Right. You can have railings around them. That's right or properly engineered screens that meet or grids, like Spencer said, to, to keep people from falling through. And if, if there's no screens and no grids, then the skylight uh, by design has to be strong enough to not ever allow anybody to, to fall through. And if you go into uh, a retail buildings, a lot of times you'll see lots of skylights. And uh, when, when you go onto the roof of those buildings, they need to be guarded or have screens or whatever or be properly engineered. But again, a lot of people fall through skylights um, because as, as time goes by, the sunlight has ultraviolet light in it. And UV will make plastic and a lot of materials weaker over time. It will make materials uh, brittle. So a skylight that's a certain strength becomes less strong over time because the sunlight is actually degrading the actual skylight. Runways. Um, if you have runways, these are essentially elevated walk lightways. They have to be at least 18 inches wide and have guardrail on each side unless you have people protected from fall protection. Okay, we got a comment. Jen, it's only on a roof service is flat and normally accessible or not, and a roof that is not accessible, right? We had a new roof put on one of our buildings with skylights. The roofers put up guides when the hole was exposed or no rails there now. Okay, right. Now, I'm not telling people, like Jen, we're not telling you you're going to have to have guardrails up, up there all the time. It's just Anytime you have anybody up there working, like roofers, they put up temporary railing around it. 
um, they anybody up there has to be in fall protection uh, when they're working near that hole. It's, well, it's actually a closed hole. It's a skylight. But um, uh, just make sure there's nobody exposed to that skylight. So if somebody goes up there to uh, work, you're going to have to either put temporary railing up or put your worker in fall protection if they're working you know, within, say, six feet of that hole. Okay. Now, dangerous equipment. Right, Jen, that's correct. Just make sure, um, and you may put it in some of your safety documentation. You, must, you might put it somewhere that might have a good place when you train employees. Our building has skylights. Um, anybody, if maintenance or anybody ever, ever has to go up there, they're going to have to either be in fall protection or we actually have to install protection around the skylight, which actually installing the, protect, the protection, <laughs> you would have to have fall protection while you're putting it up. All right. Now, anytime you're over uh, dangerous equipment, it doesn't matter how high the employee is. If you have a walkway and to the right there's a, a vat of acid or moving parts or something where people can fall into it, you would have to prevent people from falling that way. So you would use railing or whatever means you would uh, use to prevent people falling into dangerous equipment or chemicals. So this four foot or above requirement, um, the exemption is if somebody's working something near something that's dangerous. Okay, now a lot of you, a lot of you get your oil changed and you go to a quick loop place, for example, a, a service pit. So if you're in that kind of business and it's the pit's less than 10 feet deep, uh, you need to limit people's access to authorized people only. Uh, mark the floor at least six feet from the edge or place a warning line or mark the floor and have warning line and post a sign saying caution open pit. So uh, you can't subject your employees that work in that kind of business to a fall. So these are all the precautions that you need to take. And if you're taking them for employees, you're also taking them for your customers who are not employees because you don't want anybody falling into that pit. Okay, fixed ladders. Now this was one of the biggest changes in the newly revised OSHA standard. If you got fixed ladders that are, are 24 feet high above a lower level, now we're not talking about the ladder being 24 feet long. Is, is, it, is the top of the ladder 24 feet or more above, say, the ground? Now, right now, existing ladders must have a cage or well, landing platforms every 50 feet, and or you can use a cage well with a fall arrest system or safety system. So uh, a lot of the fixed ladders now, you'll see cages and wells. So you, you'll see this long ladder and you see a cage on that, you know, going all the way up, there's a little cage. So you see somebody climbing the ladder, they're inside that cage going all the way up. Now the problem with that, long term, if somebody falls, that cage or well, now well is an enclosed cage. It's like a chute. But if that person falls, they're not going to fall out, but they're going to fall down, 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 down. So these old fixed ladders that are long out there, right now, you can have a ladder safety system where somebody would connect to it, you know, connected to the ladder as they go up, or they can have a cage or a well. Okay, 2036, that's right. So um, all long ladders that have cages and wells, um, uh, you can't have those after November 18th, 2036. Now, that's a long time from now. You know, we're 2018 right now, so we've got a ways to go. So if you got long, fixed ladders, um, just have you know that you can have those cages and wells on them, 
But when 2036, have you know, you can have those cages and wells on them, but when 2036 rolls around, they need to be either replaced or modified properly with ladder safety systems that keep the worker connected. Uh, why so much time to be in compliance? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, you know, there are hearings, you know, there's politics and hearings and stuff involved with setting these regulations. So that got really pushed out. Now, let me tell you, though, that there's some things that have to be in place now. If you're building new construction, a new 24-foot or longer fixed ladder, uh, uh, you can't use cage. You can't install cages and wells. You have to have ladder ladder safety systems. That's for, that's for new long ladders right now. If you're building new, or if you had a super long fixed ladder system and you replaced a section of it. Uh, all of a sudden, that whole ladder system would have to meet the new requirement. So the only people that can still have cages and wells are the people that aren't making any modifications or they're not replacing those ladders. So some of this stuff uh, has to be done immediately, and uh, some of it has, has to be done by 2036. So anyway, that is a lot of time, but, you know, the standard, it is what it is. All right. Now here's here's a fixed ladder uh, here built into this tower. And uh, there's there's a rope that goes all the way up. So the worker has a has a harness on and they have a, a little short center lanyard with a rope grab on it. And when they climb the ladder, the little uh, connecting devices traveling up the ladder with them. And if they fall, the rope grab grabs and keeps them from falling. So um, this is a ladder safety system in place. And, the, and a lot of these towers, they're new construction. So if you see any new construction, you're not going to see cages and wells built into these towers. If you're in the billboard business, uh, there have been some changes there as well. Um, uh, these existing ladders, um, the employees must be trained on a, a fall safety, uh, wear a harness with an 18-inch rest lanyard. Um, but a lot of these people in the outdoor advertising business are going well beyond the OSHA standard. And some of these companies we talk to, they have a 100% requirement. They have to be connected 100% when they're climbing or working off the ladder or the billboard itself. Now, stairways. Now, this is, this is a good rule that's been around for a while. If you have a stairway that has four risers, you know, the vertical risers, if you count one, two, three, four, then you've got to have railing there for people to hold on to. And there's a little table there. There's a little table there on that slide that talks about stairs. How wide are they? Does it need a stair rail or a handrail? Does it need to be on one side or both sides? So if you look at that table in B1928 B11II, look on that table. You'll, you'll see whether you're compliant with your stairs or not as far as whether they have handrails or stair rails. Low slope roofs, um, you got to keep people at least six feet from the edge. And uh, so, uh, you know, you're going to have to have some way to prevent them from getting close to the edge. And uh, if you can ensure that uh, if people are protected from falling, then, then you're good to go. But just make sure. That, uh, that they're not working working near the edge. And if they're working way away from the edge, uh, again, you can, you can set up a work zone or a way 
for a roll to keep them at least 15 feet from the edge. Uh, most of you, or, probably, or maybe all of you, are in this meat slaughtering business and uh, talking about protecting people from, a, from the working side of a slaughtering platform by guardrails or travel restraint systems. Okay, and anytime you have people four feet or above, they got to protect, be protected with fall protection systems, guardrail, or safety nets. And we don't see a lot of safety nets in the industry. You can build safety nets that are OSHA compliant, but we only see safety nets mainly in construction of bridges, sometimes when buildings are built. But uh, you can use a safety net system, but again, that's not always practical. And again, here's a picture of they're building a, a wall. Well, actually, this is an existing wall beside a roadway. They're not doing construction. They're doing some, something else. If this person is standing on that wall, that person needs to be protected with fall protection. Falling objects. Anytime uh, people are working above, uh, you need to have some way to protect the people below from materials hitting them from above. So um, tow boards on the, on the scaffolds may keep things from being kicked off screens. Uh, or you can keep people away from the area by barricading. And of course, if there's a hazard from falling objects above, they're going to have to wear hard hats. Correct, Erica. But um, in general industry stand settings, if you have catch nets in work zones, hopefully you're not putting your work your workers in that work zone. Now, the people in the work zone, uh, if they're in, standing around in beneath, they would have to have hard hats on. That's a good answer. Okay, um, I'm just seeing things that really jump out. Uh, fall protection systems we've talked about. And um, you want to make sure that people are trained and they, they understand and comply with the rules and requirements for uh, fall protection and falling objects. Now, again, a lot... A lot of this is mainly related to construction, but you can have somebody working up high in a general industry uh, setting where they may drop tools or materials over the edge. Guardrails. If uh, you're building a building and you're building guardrails, you would be typically 42 inches plus or minus three for your top rail. Your mid rail will be half of that, which is about 21. And uh, you can't have you can't have deflection uh, of less than 39 above the walking working surface. So now a guardrail, steel rail is not typically going to deflect. You'll have deflections when you're using things like chain. Okay, now what's the hazard here? What's the hazard here? We have an upper level here. What, what do we have here? Okay, open session at section and railing. That's really the best answer I see here. No railing. So the problem with companies is a lot of people when they're moving materials into the upper area, they don't replace the railing. And you've got to keep people, keep on people and say, look, if you're not loading materials up there, you need to replace the top rail and the mid rail every single time. Okay. And of course, here's a great example. Safety nets, uh, you, may, you may see or use those. Uh, and uh, safety nets must meet the requirements. Actually, they're in the construction standard 1926. So you can have two types of safety nets. Um, you can have catch nets to catch materials, or you can have fall nets. So if an employee falls, they're going to be caught by the safety net. Uh, 
if you have a designated area like a work zone you got to make make sure people can stay out of that work zone and have a perimeter and a 200 pound parameter breaking strength around the work zone designated areas uh, visibly visible from a distance 25 feet away and um, if you're setting up a work zone like a, a on a roof you're going to put that barrier at least six feet from the edge so um, we see that in construction a lot uh, covers if you ever have a hole it has to be secured uh, cover that can take the maximum twice the maximum load and must be secured to prevent displacement and it should be marked as cover okay handrails um, these are the criteria for handrails the uh, height uh, requirements these these are for new handrails now if you have old handrails from the old requirement if if they're not if they're not installed after 20 you know 2017 2017 or later these are the numbers you would go from as far as that's concerned stair rails you see the numbers as well okay okay how does this okay erica asked how does this work with highway work you often hear about accidents happening on overpasses well um now that would of course get in the construction standard but they have to have ways to they have to ensure that materials can't be kicked off or, or ensure that they're caught from a work zone above a highway so you may see a lot of craziness out there in highway construction but they must have systems in place to keep things from kick, being kicked off or falling from an upper level uh, handrails and I'll, we had to speed up because we're about out of time um, handrails go against a closed wall so if you have stairs and there's a wall on one side you're going to use a handrail and you're going to have a stair rail on the open side if you have a handrail you're going to have, a, have at least three quarter of an inch opening so you can grab it with your hand uh, cages I'm going to go ahead and skip over cages wells and platforms we pretty well beat that one to death outdoor advertising um, these are the requirements for that your people have, must be physically capable of doing the work be trained how to climb ladder safety okay ladder safety systems uh, must be designed so that people can uh, climb without having to operate some other kind of safety system while they're climbing uh, personal fall protection systems uh, must meet the requirements of subpart I uh, training uh, the new standard says if you have people that are subjected to hall, fall hazards they must be trained by a qualified person so if you have people working at height that sort of thing they must be trained on fall protection what fall hazards there are how to recognize them and how to keep themselves safe Look up at anchoring tile inspection of equipment. Retraining, you have to retrain employees when they show that they don't they're not doing the right thing, or when things change, or when they uh, demonstrate they don't understand things. Now here's a picture of two people wearing harnesses. One person has way too much slack, and another one has it all right. So if that person falls, that D ring is going to hit them on the back of the head. Training must be in the language, must be done in a way where people can understand the training. And again, we've, we've covered a ton of material today, and some of it I've raced through. But um, right now, um, I'm going to go ahead and say here at 1129, I'm going to go ahead and call that the end of our webinar. And I'm going to go ahead and hold on for just a couple of se seconds. And uh, I want to thank everybody for, for being on today. Uh, it's been great. Uh, Y'all provide some good uh, questions, comments, and answers. And uh, you're all very welcome. 
And um, if you need a copy of this presentation, if you scroll to the beginning of the chat, you can uh, click on the link. Okay. Uh, now, Jen, you want to send pictures. The best thing, best thing for you to do is ask Osh at labor not nc.gov. Send those t questions and pictures to our standards officers, and they'll give you a, a legal and correct answer. I mean, I, I don't mind helping, but if you have questions and you want to send pictures, let's go ahead and send it to one of our standards officers and send it to this address, ask.osh at labor.nc.gov. Go ahead and send an email with your pictures, and th these, this will be to a standards officer and they'll send you a written reply and answer your questions. And I don't mind answering questions, but if it's very involved, we'll go ahead and send it to them. Now, I'll make sure I've covered everything. You're all welcome. Uh, Ronnie, these slides, go ahead and uh, scroll to the beginning. There's a link right to the, our site to the PowerPoint presentation. If you can't find that, Go to labor.nc.gov, go to our PowerPoint presentations, and download it so you can get these slides. Okay, uh, you're all welcome. I'm actually running over right now. It's 1131. So I'm going to go ahead and, um, and log off. You're welcome, Ricky, Michael, everybody else. I appreciate your thanks. Thank you for participating. And uh, like I said, I'm going to go ahead. You're welcome, uh, Tim. Go ahead and, and log off right now. So it's 11.32 now. And I will see you all later. I'm doing webinars tomorrow and Thursday. And I'm doing three next week. So I may be seeing you tomorrow. Okay. So anybody uh, wants to register for our webinars, uh, you're welcome to do so. So you have a good day. And I'm going to go ahead and log off. And this is Tom Wilder with the Department of Labor. Goodbye.